Hi folks, I'm Tom Affolter and this module covers Transact SQL variables and functions. It's a second of three part series on the introduction of Transact SQL that I put together for you. In this module, I hope to cover how to declare variables, a couple of different ways to assign a value such as a literal or the result of a formula back to a variable. I'll show you methods for returning values from a store procedure. We'll look at an overview of the date, time, and some mathematical and string functions that are available within Transact SQL. And towards the end, we'll discuss and demonstrate returning a primary key from an insert for use in a store procedure and perhaps a trigger. So just as with C Sharp or Visual Basic, prior to using a variable, it has to be declared. In Transact SQL, we declare a variable using the declare statement. As I mentioned in the previous module, a receive parameter acts like a class level, or in this case, a procedure level variable that doesn't need to be declared before it's used. The parameter declaration does that for you. Note that uh, parameters with variables always start with the at symbol. The format is declare, followed by the variable name that you would want to use with an at symbol in front of it. You can declare more than one variable by separating them with a comma. Variables and parameters like C Sharp are case sensitive, so be very careful. There are several methods for assigning values to variables. These on the screen are the two most common. The first, the set statement, simply assigns a value to the at var, set at var equal value. That value can come from either another variable from the result of a formula or from a literal, but it assigns a single value back to that variable. The second method I have uses the select. In this case, you'll find set a little bit more common for smaller statements like this. We'll typically use the select method for larger statements. But the select method is valuable for returning a result from a SQL select, although you can do the same as I mentioned with, with the set. But the select will allow you to return multiple values in the same statement, as you can see from the second example I have on the screen. All we had to do is create the aggregate function that returns the average age. Once we had that done and tested, I then added in the at age before the aggregate function. This redirected the value from the screen or from the select going to a table back to the variable. I could have multiple variables in this select as I had in the uh, example, as long as each returns back a valuable or a unique variable. Here's a screen capture. I first declare at height as an integer. I then write my statement to return the average height. Notice I didn't have a column header because the data is not displayed. It's redirected to the variable. Once I tested my select average height from master, I added to it at height equal before the aggregate function to pass the value of the average height back to the at height variable. In the next line, I display the height variable back to the screen with the column header height. This works when a single row is returned. Let's look at the next example, which has a flaw. Keep in mind, to place a value back to the variable, we have to have a single value. What happens if we error and have a select statement that returns more than one row? So here I've made the correction from the last slide. I modified the previous example to return a single row. This time I'm grabbing the height of the player with the player ID AARDSDA01 and displaying that variable. Again, the last line I'm proving the height from the first three lines of the script in fact returned the correct height of 75 inches. So let me one last time explain this code. The first line creates the at height integer variable. If I wanted to pull up the height of the player with the primary key or player ID of AARDSDA01, I'd simply write select height from player where player ID equals AARDSDA01. But I want to capture the height, so after I test the select, I redirect the height column to the at height variable by adding the at height equal directly before the column height 
calculation. In the third line, I display the height variable back to the output window with the height column header. To prove it worked, I added the last select to display the player's height. Both should match. As a side note, what would we do if we discovered that the height displayed a zero or perhaps a null, yet we know the data was there? Perhaps the second line did not complete before the third line. If that is the case, and it's not here, we could add a go directive between the second and third line to ensure that the variable is populated before being displayed back to the screen. Let's look at assigning values to different data types. This slide depicts how to declare a variable that is an integer at my counter. The second statement assigns zero to at my counter using a set command. Notice that when we're dealing with integers or numeric values, there are no apostrophes around the zero. In this example, we had to place apostrophes around the string because we declare at my password as a var char 30, we could get a type mismatch error if we attempted to assign a numeric value to at my password or fail to include apostrophes or square brackets if passing in a literal as we're doing here. Bit or Boolean columns are treated the same, although true is represented as one and false as zero. So if you're assigning a literal value to a bit field, you would do so with a one or a zero. So again, you select, you update, you delete, or even an aware clause bit fields by using a one, which is referred to for true, or a zero, which represents false. You cannot use true or false directly in a query as you did within Visual Basic or C Sharp. If you want to return a true or false or a yes or no from a bit field, you can use the case statement to convert the text within your select statement if you choose to. Let me go ahead and show you an example on this next slide. So what we've got here is an example where I've got a table created called member and member has a field which is is member. And within is member, what I want to do is I want to set is member um, equal to one when I have a member ID of 50,000. So that's what the first line does. Update member set is member equal to one, which is true in our case because is member would be a bit field only where the member ID is 50,000. So then if you take a look on the screen, I come back in and I select all records from member. There happens to only be one record in it right now. And you'll see it's the Fred Flintstone record from the first return back at the bottom. And I get back his member as a one. So in the next line, I return back and say, give me all of the members where his member is a zero. And basically what I'm asking it for is give me all members back where is member equals false. Again, it returns nothing back because there's a single record in here and there is no false. So the next line, I say update member, set member back to one again. I didn't need to do that. I'm not sure why I did. Um, but I go back in and I show you again how I can select from is member zero, is member one. And then the very last update statement I had on the screen is update member set is member equals three, where member ID equals 50,000. Now in a bit field, there is no value of three. There's only a zero and there's a one. But you'll notice that for some reason, and I do resent the fact that it doesn't generate an error, it didn't give me an error back when I ran it, yet when I go back in and I do the very last select statement where I do a select star from member, you'll notice that it still is a one as I originally set it. I would think that if I go back in there and try to set a bit field to a three, when it either going to be a true or false, and three is neither of them, it should generate an error. So keep in mind that it doesn't do that. So in reviewing, we know that a typical select returns a value or values in zero or more rows. In this case, the greatest or largest weight of baseball players will be returned, a single row because it's an aggregate function. We also know that we can pull a value from a select statement. In this case, we redirect the output from the screen to the variable at m weight. I previously demoed the two methods for getting values from a select. This is the alternative method. 
Again, the select can result in only one returned row. Here, we calculate the max weight in a standard select and then use the set to return the value to the at m weight variable. I don't care which method you use, but I suggest that you stick with one method. So thus far, we've calculated the results of a select and simply displayed it back to the screen. But I can also use the resulting variable to do more. In this example, we declare a variable at m weight as real. By the way, I could have received at m weight as a parameter from a store procedure as opposed to using it here as a script. This gives you an example of the differences between a store procedure and a script. I am simulating here using a declare statement what I might otherwise, if I moved it across to a store procedure, have received as a passed, as a passed in parameter. Using the select method, I would populate the at m weight variable with the calculated average weight of all players as we see here. I then use the variable in a where clause to extract all players with a weight greater than the calculated average. In other words, give me all the players that weigh more than the average weight of all the players. Here's a script we'll enter and test in a demo in just a moment. Here, I return two tables those weighing more than the average weight and those players taller than the average height. Now again, keep in mind when I say a table, a table all it has to be is one row with one column returned back is typically in an aggregate function. This is an effective as a demo only. As a programmer, we can't handle two tables returned in a C Sharp or a VB application. These would otherwise have to be received for us as programmers as two separate statements. Let's look at a demo. So I've taken that code off the previous slide. I gone ahead and pasted it within my query window, created a script, and I went ahead and executed it. And of course, what I came out with was two different tables. Let's go through the code here first and see how we derive that output. So I've got two variables here. I created one called at m weight, and I've got another one here called at m height. Both of them are data type real. They could have been an integer because, of course, weight and height are integers, but I'm assuming there's a possibility that weight and height might come back as a real or a decimal type value, so I'm going to store that, of course, into a real uh, variable to be a little bit more precise. Again, that's my choice to do that. It could have been an integer. So the next line down, uh, what I originally would have done, the process would have been something like this. Uh, to write out a select statement to say select um, the average weight, excuse me, let me correct that here, the average weight from master. And I execute that to make sure it's going to work. Boom, it worked. I'm not worried about a column header, so I want to then move this value back into a variable. So in order to do that, I simply took this statement, which you see right up here, and I added in the at m weight equals, which is my variable above. And what that did is that redirects the output from the screen, otherwise it would appear down below here, into this at m weight variable. And by the way, I could have gone back in there and I could have actually put all of this in a single statement. Um, but for demonstration purposes, um, I want to write separate store procedures in a second. I want to convert this into a store procedure for you. So I did write them separately. But again, I could have gone back in and put this guy right here at the end, right over here at the end. And I could have retrieved back two different variables from the same select statement. For simplicity's sake, again, I didn't do that. So let me get rid of this down below here. Um, so again, I created the variables. I passed the weight into the height or excuse me, the weight into the weight variable. Um, and then what I did is the next line down, I said, give me all the players whose weight is greater than what the average weight that I just calculated was. And that, let's go ahead and execute it. And let's just execute those three lines here. That's what returned this statement right here. These are all the players that weigh more than what that average player is that we, or average weight, I think it was 184 pounds that we just calculated. And the next line down, I do exactly the same thing for height. I calculate what is the average height of a player. I store the average height in 
this variable, and then I go right back down in my statement, and I say, give me all the last names and first names of the players whose weight is larger than what the average height is. So in essence, what this would do is it would give me back, and let's run it again, it gives me back all the players who have a height greater than whatever the average height is. Now, what I'd like to do is to take a portion of this and let's convert it into a store procedure because I'm simulating a store procedure right now by declaring these variables up here. I could have taken those and passed them in um, as an argument within a store procedure. So let's do that. Let's come back over here and I'm just going to use the weight portion of this. So let's create a new store procedure and I'm going to call my new store procedure get weight. So um, if my control shift M doesn't work and I do a control, I'm doing it right now, control shift M, it doesn't pop open that window that lets me fill the information in. Then I need to come up here to query and from the query I come back and specify values for the template. So I'm the creator. Let me try that. Um, today, May of 2015, description is get players names that have weight greater than the average. And I'm going to say uh, for my store procedure, I'll call my store procedure SP get overweight. Although that's not fair to say because they're not necessarily overweight, they just weigh a little bit more than the average. Now, for this to work, what am I going to pass into it? Well, let's initially assume that I'm going to pass in a weight. We'll change it here in a second, but let's assume that we're going to pass in a weight. And the weight that we're going to pass in will be an integer because that's what we're receiving. I can default it to zero. And that way, if I fail to put a weight in, it's going to grab everybody who weighs greater than zero pounds, which should be everybody. And I don't have a, I'm not going to have a second parameter. So let's get rid of these second parameters in here. And I click OK. So now it fills everything in. I don't need any of this stuff up here. It gets in my way. Um, and now I've got a little bit of extra. It assumes in the builder that I have two parameters. We need to get rid of this second parameter information here. And now all I want to do initially, until we change it, is I want to select the, and I let's go back and take a look at those fields and make sure I get the right fields right here. Go to my tables, my master table, and my fields are name first and name last, so that's what I want to do. I want to get name first. Um, I want to go ahead and get name last from master where weight is greater than the weight that we just uh, that we, we decided we're going to go ahead and pass in here. So and it defaults to zero. So let's go ahead and check that and see if it's going to work. We'll parse it. Come on, parse. Says it worked. Now let's execute it. So I now have this store procedure that I can pass any weight in, and it's going to give me every player greater than that particular weight. So let's jump over here. We know that the store, this is the name of it here. Copy. Let's, if we run it right now, it should give me every player, because it's going to default weight to zero, that has a weight greater than zero, which should be every player back. And it did, I think. Now let's go ahead, copy this store procedure here. I'm going to run back over to that window we were at just a minute ago. Let me delete this information now. I'm going to paste in, get overweight, and let's find all the players who weigh more than 100 pounds. Boom. It returns 17,377 rows on the bottom right hand, it tells me. How about all the players that weigh greater than 200 pounds? Execute it. Uh-oh. I have some, oh, there we go. I was going to say I have something wrong with my store procedure if it returned no data back. But this time it returns 3,082 rows back. Um, how many players weighed more than 250 pounds? Let's execute that. And there were 69 players, and it returns back those players greater than 250. But let's make this um, a little bit more self-contained. 
What I really want to do is I want it to do what we did before, and that is give me all the players that have a weight that is greater than the average weight. For that to happen, I don't need to pass the weight in. It's going to calculate that for me. So I'm going to take this parameter out entirely here. And let's get some of this stuff out of the way here. That's superfluous. And the first thing I want to do is I want to go ahead and calculate what the average weight is of the player. So I'll do a select average weight from master. Okay. And if I run this guy right as it is, right here, just highlight it and run it, the average weight is 184 pounds. Now, I want to capture that into a variable. So in order to do that, I'm going to come back in. I'm going to use the same variable we've got right here because it's unused now. Hasn't been declared. Hasn't been a parameter. So I'm going to take that weight. I'm going to copy it right here. I'm going to paste it here and do equal. Now the challenge is, is that I've got this variable, but I've not declared it yet. So let's do that. Let's declare it. And it's case sensitive. Declare at weight. Um, and we're going to declare at weight as a, I think we did a reel before, so let's do a reel again, see if that works. Okay. Let's check it. Now the issue I have is if I run this, I'm going, to get an, I'm going to get an error. And the error is that SP overweight already exists with the previous design we had. So all I need to do is modify that to alter. Alter the existing procedure. Check it. Execute it. And it built it. Now, all I should have to do is execute the SP get overweight. It should calculate the average weight and return only those players that have a weight that is larger than the average weight that we calculated. Let's test it. There we go. So we're working our way there, folks. Let's continue on. We will dive back into variables and parameters in the next lecture, Module 3, when we cover looping structures and conditional statements in Transact SQL. Let's change gears a bit and start talking both about system and user functions. They're an extremely powerful feature of Transact SQL. A function is a programming procedure that returns a value when it's called. Commonly, functions are passed an argument and return processed output. In this case, either in a form of a value or in the form of a table. In Visual Basic, they're called functions. In C Sharp, we call these value returning methods. Transact SQL has two main types of functions. User defined functions and custom functions. And then we have built in or system functions that we can call upon. A user defined function is one that you create yourself Whereas a system function, as I mentioned, is one that Microsoft has built in in advance. Functions are powerful, and going into great detail is outside the scope of an introduction class like this, but I think by the time I finish with them, you'll understand the basics behind and know how to implement functions. But I'll try to explain the concepts and give you some examples. I think of a function as kind of a mini store procedure, and they're coded very similarly. There are two types of user-defined functions that we're going to examine. The first is a table value function, and that is a function that returns a value in a table type format. This is comparable to a view that returns an entire table. The other type of function we're going to look at is called a scholar valued function, or we sometimes call that an inline function. This type of function returns a value as a column. In my world, I'm more likely to use scholar functions, although I've used them both. We can create a function that perhaps receives a column value and returns a calculated or a concatenated value back. We typically use a function in the middle of a, or at least a scholar function, in the middle of a typical select statement. You might otherwise have to create a join to do the same thing, even if it is possible. An example might be a column that contains a sales price in dollars. I could have a function in my select that passes in dollars and returns the exchange rate, perhaps in a yen or a British pound. Let's take a look at an example of a table function. Its purpose is to return an entire table. Its function becomes the table in the select. So if I have a select field list from, um, the table name is going to be replaced 
with the table function that I have here. Again, what I'm doing in this example, I could also do within a view. But this allows me to pass in a value that the view doesn't. So let's take a look at the code. It says create function fteam. So the name of my function is going to be called fteam. I'm going to pass into it a parameter that is not defaulted, so I have to pass in a parameter at team ID, and I'm telling it that it's going to be a varchar 4. And I'm telling it below that that you can expect that this is going to be a table. It's going to return a table, and I simply come back in and tell it as return what the table is it's going to return. And I do a select star from view master batting where team ID equals, and I simply pass in the parameter of the team ID. Let's go ahead and maybe take a look at this one in operation. So I'm back logged into my SQL Server, and I'm going to open up my baseball database. And if I look within my baseball database, I have the programmability. This is where we went back in previously and did our store procedures. And if I open that up now, I'm going to see I have a region for functions. And inside this region for functions, there are the two different types of functions that we're going to look at. Notice there's also aggregate functions down here, and then there's the system functions, which we're going to take a look at. We've already played with aggregate functions in the ANSI SQL class. But let's take a look now at the table functions, and I want to go ahead and create a new one. So I'm simply going to do a right-click on here, and I'm going to say I want a new inline table value function, or I have a new multi-statement table value function. In this particular case, let's do an inline, and you'll notice it gives me the same basic features that I get out of a store procedure. So the same thing holds true. I go to query. I want to change the parameters. I say that it was created by me, 5, 2015. Um, in this particular case, what I want to do is I want to return all the players from a particular team. So I'm just going to say return players. And I'm going to use a view from VW Master Batting. So this goes to show you that I only, I not only can reference a table, but I can also reference a view within a function. Now, what function name do I want to give it? I'm going to call it lowercase f. That lets me know I'm looking at a function. And I'm going to pull out, just call it team for now. And I want to have one parameter. It's going to be team ID. And that team ID that's going to be passed in is a varchar 4. And if I'm not sure about that, I can go back into the table design. And let's try, instead of a char char, let's do a varchar. And I'm not going to have a second parameter, so I'm going to go ahead and delete that out. Click OK. So it populates all this stuff here. I'm going to get rid of all this stuff at the top. Don't need that any longer. In fact, I don't need any of this stuff any longer either. It does get in my way, and I really don't even have to have my header, but it's nice to have edit information when you go back in and look at it and know who wrote it when, somebody that you can go to. Um, so now I'm going to take out the second parameter that we have right here. There's no second parameter in here. Now, notice what it says. It says it's going to return a table, and this is the select down here that I'm going to write that creates the table that it's going to return. So in this case, what I want to do is I'm going to select everything from VW master batting um, where um, team ID is equal to the passed in team ID at team ID, making sure the case matches both of them. I think I got everything done here. So again, let's re just review what it's going to do. I'm going to call this fteam function in place of a table right here. It's telling me I'm creating a table. It expects me to pass in a team ID when I run it. It's not defaulting to anything. Um, I could default it if I wanted to. And I'm telling it here that it's going to return a table, and this is telling it what it's going to return right here. It's going to return this, the data from this, as... FT. So let's check this and make sure it's going to work. It says it did. Let's execute it. Uh oh, there's already an FT out there. So uh, when I was creating this and testing it before, I left it. So let's come back out here and delete this FT out. Let's delete it. Now let's re. 
So notice the parse didn't catch that. It was the execute that caught it. Now I'm going to execute it, and it says it created. So I've got this routine called FTeam, and I need to pass in a team. So let's go back over here, and what I want to do is I'm going to do a select star from F. Now, in this case, uh, we'll talk about it in a minute. I have to put a DVO dot in front of it, and then FTeam. We'll talk about the DBO in just a second. And then um, I have a parameter. Now, notice this whole thing is replacing my table. Normally, I put a table here. Now, if I run it right now, I'm going to get an error because I've got no parameter passed in to FTeam. But if I turn around in here and I pass in SEA for Seattle and I execute this guy, now when I get back, Let's take a look at the team ID here. It's all Seattle players right in here. So you can see the value of that. I could have done the same thing in a view, but this is nice because now I've got this ability here to call it anytime I want, and it doesn't go to a view. It's going to come back as a table. So let's continue on and take a look at some of the next examples. So before we continue on, let's just review what we just looked at again, and that is how to call that uh, table-valued function. And here on this slide shows you exactly how to do it. We replace now the table name with the function that returns a table. We got a select star from F team, and we had to pass it in a parameter. And as long as we pass a parameter in that has a team ID on it that the table recognizes, I'm going to get those records back. Scholar functions or inline functions run at the column level. These are more like what you would expect to see coming back from Visual Basic or C Sharp. In this example, fgetFeet is a method that we pass in an argument in inches. The function's responsibility is to receive the height in inches but deliver back the height in feet. Doesn't this resemble an aggregate function? Really, in basic terms, these are custom aggregate functions. But before I go on, I want you to to take note, though, that I do have a DVO dot in front of the fgetFeet method. So there's an important purpose for that. Prior to SQL Server 2005, and in this class we're using SQL 2008, and SQL 2014 is, uh, is commonly used right now, although the ANSI SQL and Transact SQL that I'm teaching you is exactly the same throughout. Prior to SQL Server 2005, the database was tied directly to a user. If a user was deleted, you would have to delete the orphan table, or you'd have to reassign that orphan table to a new user. In SQL Server 2005, it was changed. Rather than being an owner of a table, a container object called a schema was created, and the schema owned the database. Users were assigned to the schema. The default schema is DBO dot but you can create your own. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, perhaps you offer different services to different clients and you want to keep those clients separate in different schemas. Really, what we find out is a schema is nothing more than a container object. We talk about a database as being a container that holds a variety of different tables and views, and now we've taken a look at functions and all the different things it can hold. Well, a schema is this container object that holds databases. And all it is there is to group them together. And I can refer to them. The default schema that comes with SQL Server, the one that is automatically there, is DBO dot. Now, although I've not been using best practices in my statements up to this point, Microsoft does recommend that you always start off your table name or your field name with the DBO dot table name. And the reason that they tell you that that is an improvement or that will be better is the fact that if you have multiple schemas on your database and you don't include a schema as I haven't included, then what ends up happening is SQL Server will search through different schemas for that particular statement for the function or for the store procedure, if you will, and when it finds it, it will execute it. If you include the schema in front of it, the DBO dot, and it just so happens that DBO dot is required in front of functions, then it doesn't have to go out there and search around. It knows exactly where to find it. So uh, best practices from Microsoft say include that DBO dot in front of most everything. Let's get back to the functions and look at the code. 
We first declare a function as fgetFeet and receive an undefaulted integer parameter we call height. We then declare only the data type we expect the function to return. In this case, we're telling it it's going to return, or the word returns, int. Then we have an as begin, and within the as begin, we next declare the variable that will contain the answer at feet height as an integer. We next pass at feet height the variable at height, and that's the parameter that we passed in, and we divide that value by 12. We then return back the answer at feet height from the function. This is simple, but we could have passed parameters into another table. We could have done all kinds of different things within here. The sky's the limit. This is as simple as they get. Let's take a look at this in action. So I'm back in SQL Server, logged in, and I want to create a scholar or an inline function that will accept uh, feet in inches and return back the height. So in order to do that, I'm going to go ahead and make sure I select the table I'm going to deal with, baseball. This is going to be under the programmability side of it. And I've got my functions down here, and I want to create a scholar function. Do a right click and a new scholar function. So again, same procedures we went through before. Let's go back up as soon as it finishes, and let's do a query, and let's open up a template. It was created by me. 5-2015. Um, I'm going to call this uh, height inches to feet. There we go. And I will call it f get feet. I expect it to receive one parameter, and that parameter will be the height in inches. So it's going to be of type integer that's passed in, and I don't have a second parameter, so I'm going to go ahead. Oh, and I've got to stop here because that's not what it's asking for right now. Now it's only accepting one parameter, but in this particular case now it says, what are you returning back? When you finish this answer, what do you expect the answer to be? Now, in the slide I gave, integer, and if I leave it as integer, it's only going to return back the height rounded out, 5 feet, 6 feet, what have you. If I make this a uh, real type, then it's going to return back it in with a decimal place. For now, I think I'll just go ahead and allow it to return back an integer. Later, it might be a good idea to go back and change it into a double, but because my example in the slide had it as int, we'll leave it that way. And what am I going to call the result when it's returned back? I'm going to call it feet height. Oh, let's try that better. Maybe I could be a better typist here. And let's go ahead and click OK. And it should have populated everything down below. I don't need any of this stuff in here to create it. I'm going to delete that out. And I think I've got everything in good shape here. Notice because it is an inline function, it only accepted one parameter. I can put more parameters in. Just because it didn't give it to me in the builder doesn't mean I can't do it. Um, it just allowed that only in the builder. I could put a comma here and allow uh, a different parameters to come in. So let's continue down below here. So what it's done is it's gone back in and it's filled part of this in for me. Okay, what I want to do right off the bat is I need to go back in and make a couple of changes. So it's got my feet height declared for int because it knows that's what the return value. It did that for me. But what it doesn't know is what my select statement is going to be. So really, it's pretty doggone close right now. All I really want to do is take this height that was passed in. I want to simply divide that height by 12, move that into the integer at feet, and return from this method at feet height. Pretty simple to put this one in itself. So let's go ahead and check it and make sure that it works. Okay, it parsed, and let's execute it. It said it worked. So now what I'd like to do is let's go back out there and run this F get feet on the master table that we have right now. So I'm going to go ahead and copy this guy out. 
I can't execute him because he's looking for a height without a default on it. And besides that, this guy is returning a column. He's not returning a table, so I can't do a right click and execute him the way he is right now. I have to build him into a select statement as a column. So let's do that. Let's do a new query over here. And I'm going to say select. And let's simply do a what, name last name first not a good type in day and now I want to do is I want to give another column and I want it to do an F get feet and I'm going to pass into F get feet the height column which is in inches and from master now the problem I have is that this is calculated so I have to give it a, a column and I'm I could call it height in feet perhaps, or just call it height, if, if you will. But what's happening now, and I've got an error here because I failed to put the DBO in front of it, and it's still going to show me as an error. Let's check it. It says it worked, and now let's execute it. And there you go. So this is what it's returned back to me, and the only ones that won't return back a value are those that did not have an original height. So I'm assuming this... Uh, this Charlie Ahern here probably played baseball um, in the early days before they actually stored in the table, or, or not stored in the table, if you will, but before they actually captured the player's height. Probably talking about players that played back in 1870 or so. But again, notice what the rounding did. It gave me back an integer. If I wanted, I could go back in and modify that store procedure to allow real data, and the real data would have given me decimal places after it. So hopefully this guy makes sense. In addition to the functions that you might create, Transact SQL includes many specialized functions that can save you countless hours of work. As you can see from my graphic on the screen, you have everything from aggregate functions all the way down to image functions. Just as with most programming languages, you have functions that are going to help you with dates, math, and strings. I found this link on Microsoft that covers built-in functions and lists them out. It's one of the few good Microsoft support pages that uh, I will deal with. I'll give you a demo of these in just a moment. In addition to functions, Transact SQL also has some global variables. They call them global variables, but in fact, they're really more global constants since variables expect to be changed and constants can't. These variables, if you will, when incorporated into a select will return some really valuable information. For example, if you're building a log table, you might want to store the last record added to a primary key. If you insert a record and immediately after you insert a record run a select at at identity, it will return the primary key that you just added. This is very valuable when you're adding an identity and need to grab the identity after you inserted record because you might perhaps want to put in a child record to match it. How could you relate a child record that you're putting in to a parent? You have to be able to know what that parent's primary key is in order to relate those two together. So let's go ahead and take a look at a demonstration of these different types of features. The first thing I'd like to do is show you around a couple of different websites here that I referenced in my slides. This is the first one, a Microsoft website that comes back in and lists out all the different types of functions that are built in to Transact SQL. And some of these are outside the scope of the class, but there's many of them in here that are very valuable. So we're taking a look through the scholar type functions. These are the ones that are replaceable. These, Again, remember, Scholar says that they're replaceable columns. So we also have Scholar system functions as well. And we have things that allow us to do conversions and casting, which we'll take a look at in just a second. Um, there's other ones allow date time functions. If I click on that, we're going to find out that we can take a date time field and break it apart and come back in and grab out the date, the time. We can actually go back in and pull out the system date off the server. This will give me back the system date, as we'll take a look at a little bit later. Um, get date returns back the current date, if I want. That's today's date, which we'll take a look at. And down below here, I can pull out things from a date. So if I want to pull out a specific part of the date, I want to pull out the month, the day, the year, I can pull that out of the uh, uh, a date field, perhaps, as well. 
And there's a lot of different areas in here that you can deal with. Um, date time has very valuable uses because remember that date time uh, data types are different because they have to treat date not left to right as a string does, but it has to do date math on it, and that's what these functions allow us to do. Another area that I want to take a look at is let's look at these string functions down here. String functions have a nice um, use because it allows us to go back in there and do some conversion. So within a string, I can grab the left number of a certain characters. I can say, give me the left five characters of a string. Or tell me how many characters a string has in it. Or I can convert a string into lowercase. Or if I look over here, I can convert a string into uppercase. I can also look in the middle of a string if I want to and say, start the fourth character and read five characters across. Um, what's another important one in here that I like? Uh, sound exalator is one that you can use. It's, it's an interesting one because you can come back in and create a where clause and tell it that you're looking for, um, for example, the name Smith. And if you do a sound off, a sound X of the name Smith, it's going to return back all the different spellings that come close to Smith, things that m would include like Smythe, S-M-Y-T-H. Uh, let's see what else in here is very important in here. Character index. Character index is one that I use a lot because it allows me to go back into a string and look for a particular character. Um, an example I used recently was I want to pass in an email address and I want to take the user out of the email address separate from the domain. So I might have an email address of, of you know, Joe Blow at hotmail.com and I want to pull the Joe Blow out. So I would look at the at symbol in the string and if I combine that with this left, I could say find the character here, perhaps it's in the eighth location, and then I could say grab the left eight characters with the left method and it would return back that one portion of the string if I wanted to. Let's jump back over here and take a look at mathematical functions because these are extremely powerful as well. And again, keep in mind that when we're running SQL Server, anything we can do with the exception of formatting data because that's the responsibility of the programmer, but anything that we can do on the data as far as data transformation, calculations, formulas, we can do at the server. It is much quicker to have SQL Server perform those math calculations than it is to go over and have your VB or your C Sharp or your Ruby program, for example, to do the same thing. So within the math calculations, we have the traditional math type functions you would think of. Absolute values, which strips off plus and minus and just gives you an absolute value. The absolute value of minus 55 would be 55. The absolute value of 55 is 55. But we have arc cosine, arc sine, all the way down to ceiling, the highest number in a range, the floor, the lowest number, exponential. We can raise values of numbers if we want to. Um, pi simply returns back the equivalent of pi, which is extended out 3.14, um, which is approximate, but pi returns an exact. Power is very similar to exponential. It lets me go back in and say raise this to a certain power, radians, rounding, um, all kinds, scoring a number, all different kinds of mathematical operations that we can perform. And again, if we can do it on this side before we send it to the programmer, it's that much better. So what I'd like to do now is let me get my SQL Server together and let's jump over and take a look at some of these functions in operation. And before I jump forward, I didn't miss one thing, and I want to show you this website here. It's called, it's a Code Project website. Code Project is a great site to go to because they give all kinds of examples of different code, but you always have to be careful and take a look at dates here um, and make sure the date is current. 2009 is not very current to today, but as it just so happens that Transact SQL has not changed that tremendously, and this is a very pertinent page. And what it does is it comes back and gives us some information as far as, well, um, these are going to be global variables, and again, I mentioned I don't like them called global variables because variable makes it sound like they can be changed. But in actuality, these are really global constants. It's something we can ask the server to return back to us. Things like, what are the number of connections that our server currently has in it? Um, going back down, at, ID, at, at identity is a, is a very important one that I use all the time. This is the one I'm going to demonstrate in a minute. What happens is if I add a record to a table, I might need to know immediately what that identity field was that it was added to so that I can add in child records. And it's going to be the add identity that's going to return back 
to me that information. If I run a select statement and I need to store how many rows were returned back, at row count will return that back to me. If I need to know how long it took to run that store procedure for whatever reason, I can do uh, time ticks down here. If I want to know the version of my SQL Server that's running, I can run at at version if I need to. And later we would find out that we could use at at error if we wanted to capture an error message that came back. Without it having to go into the screen, I might want it to go and redirect it out. Um, I could do that as well. Uh, some of these are a little bit outside the scope of this class, but we're going to take a look here at a couple of these in actions in the next video demonstration. So I'm back logged into my SQL Server again, and we're going to take a look at some examples, some demos. And the first thing I want to do is come back down here and show you the different system functions that exist. So if I open it up, I'm going to see that there are a variety of different types of functions. I have aggregate functions, configuration functions, all the way down to text and image functions inside here. And if I open up, I can see the different date functions that I could utilize. So you'll see down here that there's one called get date. And let's create a new store procedure here. Excuse me, a new uh, query. <coughs> Pardon me. And let's do a select. And all I want to do is I'm going to select out... Um, the get date. I'm not pulling from a table. I just say, well, I want you to tell me what the date is. And you'll notice that it brings back today's date, the date that I'm executing this for the first time. And if I want to, I need to put a column header on that. I could do today here and execute it. Uh, another thing that I could do is I could take a date field and subtract it from get date and tell you how many days there are in between it. But for me to be able to do that, I would want to know the number of days in there. I would use probably the date part method in here to come back and tell me the number of days inside here. Um, let's look at another one down in here. Let's look at um, string functions. I like those a lot. I use them all the time. And one of the things that I like to do is if I'm bringing data back in, I might want to go back in and, and find out what is the length of a particular field. So let's go back in and let's look at the master table here. Okay, I'm bringing master up. And let's ask it what the length of the, hmm. I think I'll grab this guy right here out. I'm going to copy that data. And I want to know what is the length of the player ID for this guy. So I can say, I want to know the length, L-E-N, of player ID. That's the parameter I'm passing into it from master. Now, if I run this, it's going to be, watch this, it's going to give me the length of every player ID that exists out there. But if I want a specific one, um, I can go back in and say where, and let's see, that was um, N, um, was player ID equals, because it's a string, and now it's going to tell me how wide basically this field is right here. Nine characters. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So length returns that. If I came back in and I said, wait a minute, really what I want is I want the left two characters of player ID. Uh oh, I think I got a mistake in here somewhere, do I? Nope, there we go. AA. Um, I probably should put a column header there, but it just pulled the AA off. The left two. What is another one that we might want to do inside here? Oh, how about, here's a good example. If I run a select statement here and take a look at the data, I'll see that the player ID is coming in lowercase. Um, in fact, let's take a look over here at the city. Let's look at birth city. Now, notice how birth city is an upper and lower case. One of the problems that you might come across is if you had to create a report and sort by city, even though SQL Server doesn't care about case sensitivity when it comes to this, reports do. So if you have some data that's entered in upper case or some data that's entered in upper and lower case, you're going to have a challenge. You want to make sure all the data comes back consistent. So what I typically will do is make sure that all the data comes back in an uppercase format. So check this out. If I want, I can say, let's get the upper, and we were doing birth city. 
and I'll call it birth city. And what it does is it's simply going to come back in and convert all those birth cities back in to uppercase. So we have a lot of different opportunities when we're dealing with those date in the string functions. Another thing that I want to do is to show you some of those system constants that we talked about. So let me close some of this out. And in this case, what I'd like to do is I'm going to clear this out and go to the contributions table. And let's go ahead and take a look at what we've got in contributions. Here. And I've created this members table. Now, this was not normally in contributions. I just threw it in there for right now. It really has no place in it because it really is not pertinent to the rest. But it's a table that I put together, and it has a member ID, name, address, city, state, zip, and donation. This is the table that I had in that demo on the slide. Um, so if I do a select, select star from member, I'm going to get back that one record that I had put in with Fred Flintstone and a member ID. If I look at the design of the table, I find that member ID is a primary key and it's also an identity field. That means it's being automatically assigned by the computer on my behalf. Um, looking at this, I'm assuming that the starting number was 50,000 and it incremented by one. We could take a look at that and prove that. Let's go back out and uh, let's look at the design of that table. Oops. Let me try that again. I selected the wrong thing. Probably Pull out all data. No. Let's look at the design. Too much of a delay here. So here's the table, member ID, and there's the column. And if I come down below here, I'll see that the identity specification is turned to yes, and it increments by twos, and it starts at 50,000. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm simply going to go back in and add a record into this member table, and what I want it to do is tell me where it placed that record as far as a primary key. So let's do that. Let's come back over here, and I'm going to uh, edit the top 200 rows here which is only one row in here right now. I'll let it bring back that table. As speedingly fast as it is here. And I'm going to go back in and add a record. So, of course, this is the identity field, so I ignore that entirely. So I'll add in Barney Rubble at 456 Rockway. And he, too, lives in Bedrock, Washington, 99001. He made no donation. And now notice when I put it in here, I can put it in as true or false in the data, but what's going to happen is it's going to convert it back to one or zero when I have to extract the data out. So it'll show it to me in this case as true or false, uh, but that's only for me looking at the raw data. The client, if I pass this to a program on the other end, may not see this directly. So now I've just added in that record. I've added the record in. I'm going to close this out, and I'm going to ask it a question. I'm going to say, I'd like to know what the at at identity is. Run it. Oh, and it didn't pull it back to me. Hmm. Now why was that? Probably because it's going to make me put that data in by hand. So let's go back in and take a look at that. Um, let's try it one more time. Let's build this as a script, see if that's the case. So let's insert into members values and now I'm going to include the values in the parentheses I'm going to put in, and this should take care of the problem. So I have to put it in in the same order. So this case, I'm going to put in Wilma. I'm just going to put her in as Wilma. Now I better put Flintstone. Okay. The next field it's looking for is name, uh, excuse me, address. So one, two, three, main. 
I think that's where Fred lived. And the next thing is Bedrock, Washington, 99001. Um, the last thing that I'm putting in is the um, donation amount. How come I had a logic on the previous one? Let's refresh this guy. Look at that columns. His member was missing off that first example. I was wondering where that was. I'm not sure why it didn't show up. Donation, and he is not a member. Let's check this. Or excuse me, he is a member. One is true. Let's check it. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to execute it. What's going to happen is it's going to insert that record, and notice I didn't put a primary key in here, or I didn't put an identity field in. It's going to automatically assign it. In my program, I might need to know what that identity field is. Why? Well, I might be putting in child records in another table in this store procedure or in this function. And in order to do that, I have to have this information right here. So this should return back the primary key. Um, I believe it would be 50,002. It should be four, I believe. Let's run it. Uh-oh. And it's not members. It's member. So you notice that my parsing didn't catch that before. Execute it. It runs it. And there's my add, add identity that's being returned back here. And of course, I'd have to capture it with some variable, so I should probably put identity after it. Something that I could read off of it. Let's re-execute that again. Oops, I didn't like that. Now, identity is a reserved word. That's why it didn't let me put it in there. If I think I have to use identity, I can put square brackets around it. But I think I'll call it ID instead. That way I don't have to worry about a conflict. And there's my ID. Now, of course, it added a new record in now. So I actually have Wilma Flintstone in there in my table twice. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at a couple of other things. One of the things that we looked at in the ANSI SQL class is the fact that in a formula, um, how do you cast out a number if you need to cast it? Um, and in we really can't do a lot of casting in ANSI SQL, but remember before we talked about casting numbers, if I do something like this, select um, 5 times 5, and I execute that. It returns back an integer of 5 times 5. An integer times an integer will always return back an integer. But if I introduce a decimal here, 0, it introduces back it as a decimal. So what we find out in SQL is a formula is always going to be as accurate as the most accurate piece of information in it. And in Transact SQL, what we found out is, excuse me, in ANSI SQL, is if we wanted to have to do some casting or conversion, what we had to do is go back in or at least make sure that the data came back in as a double and it was in a column. We'd have to take that column and simply multiply it times 1.0. I truly think that's the easy way to do it. But there are some alternate ways of casting as well. And in fact, one of the things that we cannot do in ANSI SQL, and let's take a look at um, the, we've got this field here called donation field. So let's just go back in and take a look at that. Um, let's do everything back from member. Execute it. And we've got all this information. Now what I'd like to do is I'd like to put a statement together that says, Fred Flintstone donated $100. Barney Rubble donated $0, or Wilma Flintstone donated $0 on this. But the problem I have with ANSI SQL is it can't be done, because I cannot merge a numeric column along with a string column together. If I try to do that, something like this, if I concatenate them together, I would say concatenate name. Then what I'd like to do is have it say, oops, plus donated, and then I want to add into it after the donation amount. Okay. Now let's execute this. It says the parse worked, but if I execute it, I got a problem because I cannot plug together a float or a numeric column along with a string column, and I've got three different string columns in here. I better put a space in front of this here. So what I had to do is I, in ANSI SQL, couldn't be done. What I can do, though, is there's a couple of options I can do, and there is a cast method. 
And the cast method allows me to cast this back into a string and plug it in. So in order to do this, it has to only be transact SQL. So let's use the cast method here. So what I want to do is I want to cast. And the cast follows what the name of the field is. I want to cast donation. And all I have to do after that is say as varchar and decide, excuse me, char, and decide what the data type or data length is going to be. Let's put 10 characters here. Now, this we may have a little bit of a problem, but let's leave it as 10 characters for right now. And, of course, I have to close out my last parentheses. These parentheses surround here, and I have this guy. And um, I don't know, um, what am I going to call this? I'm going to call it donor. Okay. So notice I had to put a column header on it. So I'm plugging in name, whatever the name field is, and do I have a name field out here? Yes, I do. Name plus donated plus I'm going to cast in the donation, but before it plugs into the string, it's going to convert it into a var char 10. Let's go ahead and check it. It says it works, and let's execute it. And there we go. Fred Flintstone. I notice I spelled Fred Flintstone. Donated 100. Now, of course, if I wanted, I could put in a dollar symbol in front of this and re-execute it again. Oops. I'm going to not highlight that. Parse it. Execute it. And I have my dollar symbol in front of it. So there's an example of a cast method that exists out there. It's pretty simple to utilize. Um, and I think here, let me try if it'll let me do this. Let's see what row count will return by itself. Notice what it did is based on the very last select statement that was run, it ran row count and it told me that there were four rows, one, two, three, four, returned from my statement. Now, that can be used in a lot of mathematical calculations if you choose to, but it's just one example of many different types of functions and methods that we have out there. So in closing, we've really only touched the tip of the iceberg with respect to the power of user-fine tables and inline functions, as well as the value of system functions and variables. It's how you implement and how you choose to implement that's really the power behind these tools. I'd highly recommend that you play around with them a little bit because it's really this aspect of SQL that separates the amateurs from the professionals. You'll find in most cases that a lot of the SQL Server developers will be working primarily with ANSI SQL, but for those people that have this special skill, it can be dealing with Transact SQL. And again, the Transact SQL we're doing here is not a big leap between the PL SQL, if you will, that we would find in Oracle. What this does, though, is opens the door to a lot of different opportunities, a lot of power you can put on your resume. And in the third tutorial, or the third module, if you will, I'm going to cover some of the power of logic within a Transact SQL statement.